You what? I said to my wife. Hindsight shown me that I should have been alerted. That something was up weeks ago. For more than seven weeks now, my wife, Brianna, has been especially attentive to me. She has been making a really nice breakfast for me. Instead of just toast and coffee. She has been preparing my favorite meals. For dinner, even including wine. After dinner she has been changing into new lingerie. And then becoming very affectionate until dragging me off to bed at an early hour. Did I have a second thought about these alterations? To our 24-year marriage, not one. I blissfully accepted these changes as part of our new normal. Since our last child had left home for college only a few months before. I wanted to do more for Brie too. I tried to be home every evening no later than 5 p.m. I started taking her out on dates to nice restaurants. I took her to several small theater shows in the local area. We went dancing for the first time in months. I brought her flowers. I was all set to enjoy the benefits of being empty nesters. I'm Tyler Winslow. My nickname is Ty. My wife Brianna Bree. And I have had a great marriage for almost a quarter of a century, or so I thought. Like all marriages, we have had our ups and downs. But the ups have far outweighed the downs. I was content with life. I work at a large publishing company. Over the years, I have become proficient at all aspects of publishing, editing, and review of submissions. Meeting with creators, negotiating terms, collaborating with design professionals, developing timelines, budgeting marketing costs, and working movie rights. I take great pride in bringing a new book and a new author to the public. Consequently, after 20 years of broad experience, I find myself as a senior director for the company. My wife, Brie, is an extremely good-looking woman who is almost 45 years old. Both of us have kept in good shape because of good genes, an active lifestyle and the right food. People often say we are a good-looking couple. Since she started back to work, after our youngest boy started kindergarten, Brie has worked as a paralegal for a large law firm. Thomas, Dixon, and Harris. She has become the managing paralegal and assigns work that comes to her office to the subordinate paralegals. My life took a right angle turn on Wednesday of last week. I came home as usual about 5 p.m. Brie was busy in the kitchen with dinner. For the last several weeks, she has been preparing a dinner that has been above and beyond what we had before the kids moved out. I kissed her on the back of her neck as I entered the kitchen. Lately, Brie would turn around and give me a full body kiss at this point. But this time she didn't. I don't rate the mind blowing kiss. I've been getting for the last two months. I exclaimed. What's happening? Nothing, she replied. But I am happy to have my man home, she said instead. She never turned away from her work on the countertop. It seemed a little cold as though she didn't want to face me. For even the few seconds it took to turn and give me a kiss. Is there something wrong? I asked. You seem to be preoccupied. No, nothing, not a thing, she replied. Change your clothes and when you come down. I'll have a glass of your favorite wine for you. Now, it seemed. She was trying to rush me out of the kitchen rather than share a few moments of affection. I shrugged off the feeling I had that something was off. And proceeded up the stairs to the bedroom. After hanging my suit up. And tossing my dress shirt in the laundry basket. I changed into my comfortable dockers and a pullover sport shirt. Dinner wasn't lavish but, apparently. Brie had gone all out to make it especially enjoyable. She had been doing that for several months. Dinner was a chopped lettuce and tomato salad followed by the main course of roast port on a bed of rice cauliflower. When we toasted with the wine, Brie said, You know I love you, don't you? It was different then, I love you followed by my obligatory. I love you too. After dinner, we cleared the table. Brie put the unused food away. And it was my job to rinse the dishes and put them in the dishwasher. While I was doing that, Brie said that she was going upstairs to change into something more comfortable. I could hardly wait to see what it was. 
When I left the kitchen and stepped into the family room, the lights were dim and Brie was stretched out seductively on the sofa. Her negligee barely covered up her vital regions. While the low-cut neckline showed her C-cupped breasts splendidly, I didn't waste any time and kneeled down at the sofa to kiss her. It was an exotic kiss. From there, I kissed her bare shoulders and peeled what little material there was. From breasts down to her navel. She had beautiful breasts. They were her best feature. I was kissing, sucking and licking Bree's breasts while, at the same time, running my hand higher and higher along her bare leg. Bree's curvaceous legs were another of her best features. You love me, don't you, Ty? You'll always love me, won't you? No matter what. Of course, I will, I replied. I stood up and undressed as quickly as I could. And then I laid down on the sofa with her. I wasn't going to waste the time. It would take me to carry her upstairs. The time for foreplay was over. I couldn't wait to fuck her. And she couldn't wait any longer either. A half an hour later, we cuddled up on the sofa. I commented that she had been especially ardent this evening and, in fact, her lovemaking had been sensational for several weeks now. I'm happy we've regained some of the lust that we had lost over the years, I said while lightly kissing her neck and throat. Our pillow talk drifted from how good-looking she was. Even though she was approaching her 45th birthday to how toned her body was for her age. You could easily be mistaken for 30 or 35, I said. Brie returned the compliment by rubbing her hand over my six-pack. And said that she was happy, too, that I take such good care of my body. I was only half awake when Brie said, Baby, I have to talk to you about something. Anything, I lazily answered. First of all, she started, you know how much I love you. Don't you? Yes, and I love you just as much, I replied. Honey. She said so quietly that I could barely hear her. This coming Friday, I made arrangements to go on an overnight date with a man from my office. Her pronouncement took a few seconds to register in my brain. When it did, I propped myself up and looked straight into her eyes and said, You what? She tried to pull my head back down to her chest, where I had been resting, but I stiffened up. You what? I repeated. It won't make a difference about how we feel about each other. I will still love you and you will still love me. Are you kidding me? Is this some sort of joke? I asked her. No, hey, this is not a joke. On Saturday I have a date with a man, a lawyer, from my office. We are going to go out for dinner and dancing. And then to his hotel room. I'm going to stay with him overnight. I'll be home sometime late in the morning on Sunday. In other words, you are going to fuck some asshole all night Saturday and Sunday morning. Is that right? Please don't use those terms. They are so crude. He's a very nice man. I like him very much. I was wide awake now and alert to what was being said. I started putting on my clothes to indicate that. Our intimate time together was over. It was obvious to Bree that I was not happy. Please, Ty, don't be like that. I still love only you and you still love me. It will be just this one time and then it will be over. In a week we'll be just like we are now. And you'll have forgotten all about it. I don't think so. Brie, I snorted. Who is this Prince Charming, Brie? Why now, when things are going so good for us? Do you want to completely ruin our marriage? Brie, who was now putting on her satin robe, said. I don't want to give you his name because it is not important for you to know. And I don't want you to attempt any retribution against him. Besides, he's bigger than you and he would probably hurt you in a fight. Not with rage on my side and a baseball bat in my hands. I countered. And, continued Bree. It will be only this one time because he's leaving Sunday night for his regular job in New York. And he won't be back. He'd better get out of town, I told her. Otherwise, the next time he enters a courtroom. It will be on crutches. Beside my first reaction to Bree's pronouncement which was anger, I was now starting to feel a sense of loss. 
Brie and I had been together for more than 20 years. She'd been my only lover since we took each other's cherries. In our senior year in high school, I have been tempted but I have never touched another woman. In a sexual way. So, how long has this affair been going on? I asked. It isn't an affair. We've hardly touched each other. What is, hardly touched each other? I wanted to know. Do you mean holding hands, hugging, kissing? Does it include petting? Bree did not answer my questions which made me believe. It was up to the petting stage. Otherwise, she would have admitted to the lesser types of affection. He was loaned to us about six months ago. From a prestigious law firm in New York to work on a particularly complex tax case. Because it was so complex. Me and several of the other paralegals have been doing a lot of his research. Also, I have worked closely with him in designing the charts and graphs we are going to use in court. Over time, we have become very close. Two months ago, he told me that he had strong feelings for me and wanted to sleep with me. I had no intention of sneaking off to some cheap motel for sex. Or staying late at work to be taken on a desk somewhere in the office. Our relationship was special. And too genuine for that type of cheap relationship. We wanted a special night that was just for us. He asked me if I could come up with a pretense. To get away for a weekend or even overnight sometime. I told him that I doubted I could come up with an excuse. To cover that much time. Besides, I said, I really don't want to lie to my husband. He asked me if my husband would be agreeable. Or could be made agreeable to us being together for a day, a night or a weekend. I told him that I knew you were deeply in love with me. But I didn't know whether or not you would divorce me over a one-night stand. I didn't think so, especially if you knew that. It was just a what-time interlude, and it would never happen again. But I couldn't be certain. Why do you want to do this to us, Brie? We have everything we could possibly have in a marriage. We love each other. We have fabulous sex. We have great kids. There are no money problems. Our health is good. Why? My friend has convinced me that I am missing something. You are the only man I have ever been with. I feel I need to experience more. He has shown me there is more with him. It will complete me as a woman. Also, he cares for me and I have feelings for him, too. It is not a tawdry affair, but Brie, I exclaimed. We have had such a wonderful union. You are the only woman I've ever had and I'm the only man. You've ever had. You don't understand. Hi, I need this. I want this. I want him why in the world do you need this? I asked he is a beautifully handsome man who is much younger than me but, nevertheless, finds me irresistible. I am drawn to him like a moth to the flame. I just have to have him, at least once. Or I will never be content again. He said he feels the same. Please, baby, let me do this. Then, I will be yours forevermore. I will never consent to this, I retorted. It will ruin us and destroy our marriage. No, it won't, baby. Don't stop me from doing this. And I will be the most wonderful wife you could ever imagine. I will cook for you, take care of the house, do the laundry, shop for groceries and everything else. And I will be the best sex partner you could ever imagine. You will be able to do anything you want to me anytime you want it. I will treat you like a king for the rest of your life. And I'll never touch another man again ever. I promise. Except. I will have a wife who fucked another man and made a cook hold out of me. I replied. For a man, it is the ultimate expression of disrespect. You will have to get over it. I'm going to do this, Ty. I need to have this experience with my friend. It will change nothing between us. I will still love you and you will still love me. So. This is why you've been so attentive and affectionate toward me for the last two months. It has nothing to do with being empty nesters. You thought that if you whined and dined me, I would be less inclined to lose you over a one-night stand. And more inclined to acquiesce to your date. That's not going to happen, Brie. Brie steeled herself against all of my arguments and protests. 
Her mind was made up and she wasn't going to change it. I wasn't going to beg. She would just have to suffer the consequences. Whatever they turned out to be. I didn't know yet. I went up to the master bedroom. And gathered up some clothes for the next day and some toiletries. And went to the guest room that. In our large home. Had its own bathroom. Brie intercepted me as I was moving my stuff. Please don't be like this, Ty. Nothing is going to change. I know you are a little angry right now. But it will all be over by Sunday afternoon, and we can be ourselves again. I'm more than a little angry. If you do this, I said in a very calm but deliberate way. We will never be ourselves again. I closed the door to the guest bedroom in her face. Without saying another word. I was alone with my thoughts. I considered all the standard obvious alternatives, divorce. Moving out, throwing Brie out which appealed to me more. Physically preventing her from going on her date, calling her parents, calling our kids, and more. There was no way I would divorce her. Regardless of her temporary insanity. I still loved the shit out of her. I rejected the rest of my obvious choices. I was not going to move out of my own house. Also, regardless of what went down, Bree was going to be trying her best to make it up to me so, physically, I would have a maid and a sex slave for the rest of my life. I had no intention of calling the family and outing her. Because I wanted to keep this dispute just between us. She might decide to call off her tryst. If her family talked her out of it, but that meant it would be due to outside influences. Besides, that just might make her want to be secretive about a future date. If she decided against fucking Prince Charming, she would have to decide that for herself based on the merits of our marriage. It was Thursday night. Without a doubt, Brie had waited until almost the last moment to announce her date. It limited the time that she would have to deal with an angry husband and reduce the time I had to convince her. What a bad idea her date was. The lack of time also limited my possibilities to obviate her date. My mind wasn't functioning as a machine. I was scared that I was losing my wife. She said that she had feelings for this guy. Perhaps, now that the kids had left home, she might be considering leaving me for him. That would completely break my heart. After she had sex with him, she might prefer that to our lovemaking. Or... She might become interested in strange sex with more men in the future. Bree and I have been having sex for 25 years. And there weren't many surprises in bed anymore. Nevertheless, I regarded our intimacy as comfortable and enjoyable. Even after 25 years, her body still turned me on. I would get excited just thinking about her in a sexy negligee. Or a tight, figure-hugging little black dress, or just a towel. And I know I always got her off when we made love. That was always a source of pride for me. I loved to feel her body stiffen as her climax hit her. I loved to look into her eyes. As her orgasm rolled through her body. Then, I thought, maybe I can throw a monkey wrench into her plans. Perhaps, somehow. I could preclude her date from ever taking place. Prince Charming would be gone. Before a backup rendezvous date could be arranged. And I would have time with my wife to set her straight on what she was risking. And extract some sort of benign vengeance to prevent her from ever considering anything like this. Again, before I drifted off late Thursday night, I came up with a plan. Apparently, I couldn't dissuade Brie from having an affair with Prince Charming, but maybe her employer could. I know that Thomas, Dixon, and Harris had an employee non-fraternization policy. If Bree's relationship was mentioned to one of the senior partners, perhaps they would talk with Bree and discuss how her job might be affected by having a relationship. P with an associate. I was up first the next morning. Although I normally made coffee for Bree before I left for work. I didn't this time. She said good morning but I didn't acknowledge her greeting. Don't do this. Was all I said and I left the house soon after without the usual kiss goodbye. I'm certain she noted the coldness of my actions. My plan, if you could call it that, was to talk briefly with the managing partner, William Thomas. 
I had met him a number of times over the years, at various social functions of his law firm. He seemed like a good guy, easy to talk to and down to earth, as personal as it was. I wanted to let him know what was happening between me and Breed and the name New Yorker in his office. Perhaps he could talk to her about the consequences of her date the next night. I wasn't a lawyer, but I thought that Thomas, Dixon and Harris would not want to open their firm up to a possible sexual harassment suit by my wife if she were to get pissed off at the company for any reason. In mid-morning on Friday, I drove downtown to the office building of Thomas, Dixon, and Harris. I took the elevator to the top floor, where the three partners had their offices and large meeting rooms for their most important clients. The outer office was a large, open area with a single desk in the middle of it. To the right was a lounge or waiting area with plush, overstuffed chairs, a sofa, and a coffee table. To the right was a full bar set inside flush-mounted cabinets. Modern, tasteful, and expensive paintings decorated the walls. I had been in this area a number of times for small social events with Bree. Guarding the gates to the partner's offices was Emily Stratton, the lioness. I knew Emily, too. From the several parties in this area and other social events over the years, we were friends. Emily was probably the most pleasant person at the law firm. She always had a smile on her face and a happy attitude. Emily's age was about 55. But her age did not detract from her beauty. Her face was sort of plain or, at least, not movie star beautiful. However, I thought she was a beautiful person. She was about 5 foot 4 inches tall in the bare feet. Her body, on the other hand, was something to die for. She didn't wear sexy clothes that showed off her feminine assets. Rather, she always wore a suit jacket with matching pants or skirt. If it was a skirt, it was normally an ankle-long skirt with a slit only as high as the knee. It was enough, however, to see that she had a curvaceous calf. Occasionally, I would see Emily without her suit jacket on. If she wasn't wearing a loose blouse, then it was a loose sweater. She never showed cleavage. But it was easy to tell that she had a very nice rack, probably a D, at least. Her golden blonde hair was always in a business-like bun. And she wore glasses. Emily recognized me as soon as I came through the heavy, cut glass doors. She smiled and stood up to come to me and hug me briefly even though I was in an unsmiling, sour mood. It was impossible not to smile back at her. Gosh, Todd, I haven't seen you for a while. Did you come all the way up here just to see me? I guess she couldn't imagine that I had business with the senior partner. I need to talk with Mr. Thomas briefly, I stated. It's important and it's personal, Mr. Thomas is in, Emily stated while looking at her appointment book but I don't see you on his schedule. He's very busy today with meetings and clients. Is there anything that I can help you with? It's nice of you to offer, Emily. But I really have to talk with Murdot Thomas. Again? It's very personal and I only need a few minutes of his time. She could read the seriousness of my request in my face. This has something to do with your wife, doesn't it? A perceptive Emily asked. I liked Emily and I had no wish to burden her with my troubled marriage. Maybe, was all I said. Putting on her glasses, Emily started looking at her daily schedule of the partner's activities. Mur, Thomas is about to finish up with a meeting. He has about 30 minutes before he's out the door to meet with some important clients over lunch. When he returns to his office, I will run interference for you and ask him for a minute of his time. While I was waiting for Thomas to return to his office, I sat in the lounge area. I wasn't there very long before Emily came to me. With a cup of coffee. I put a shot of Bailey's in it, she said. It looks like you can use it. At that point, Emily's intercom went off. I'm back in my office, Emily, I heard Mr. Thomas say. Has anything come up? Emily took advantage of the opening, Mr. Thomas, I have Tyler Winslow with me. He would very much like to talk with you for a few minutes. 
it's important to him. HMMMM, I heard Mr. Thomas consider his time. If you think it's important, Emily, send him in. I can give him about five minutes then I have to be out of here. Emily had me follow her through another set of glass doors. Down the short hallway to a large carved wooden door. The sign said, William Thomas, Counselor at Law. She opened the door. Motioned for me to enter, and then closed the door. I was suddenly in a spacious office. Dotmar. Thomas was standing behind a large desk at one end of the room. There were several chairs in front of the desk. There was a lounge area at the other end of the office. With a chair, sofa and coffee table. Dotmar. Thomas's law degrees were prominently displayed on the walls. Dotmar. Thomas walked around his desk and approached me. He put out his hand to shake mine. Ty, it's good to see you. How are you these days? Still in the publishing business. I'm good, I answered and enthusiastically. Well, Ty, Emily thinks it's important for you to talk to me. If it's important to Emily, it's important to me. What's on your mind? Suddenly, I had second thoughts about talking with Murdot Thomas. But I started to blurt out what I thought I wanted to tell him. I'm sorry to bring this to you, Murdot Thomas. And now, I'm embarrassed about it. What is going on in your life, Ty? He said, apparently genuinely interested in my problem. The situation is Mr. Thomas, my wife Bree, has told me that she intends to sleep with one of your associates this Saturday. She is adamant about her overnight date. And I can't dissuade her, Mr. Thomas was a very perceptive lawyer. And you want me to intervene in some way to stop this? Perhaps talk with Bree or whoever this associate is. Is that right? That was my original intention when I stepped into your office. Mr. Thomas, but I changed my mind. This is my problem, and I should solve it. Without burdening anyone else with it. I'm certain you know. That we have a company policy on fraternization between employees especially when they are in the same department and one has authority over the other. It can open us up to an eventual lawsuit. If and when things go south in their relationship. Bree is our top paralegal. She's been here for a long time. And is subject to a lot of oversex lawyers. I'm the man who hired these lawyers. I hired them because they had superior qualifications. In their areas of expertise. And I hired them because they were assertive in the pursuit of their cases. I was like that when I was a trial lawyer. And I'm not completely proud of my actions when dealing with women that worked around me. So, Bree has had to deal with these guys for years. It's hard to believe that one of them got through to her. Yes, sir, was all I managed to say. Time, mister. Thomas put his hand on my shoulder. The fraternization policy we have now is useless. I could and I should republish it, making it much more binding with definitive consequences for violations. However, I can't do it before Saturday. You know lawyers, they have to write it, study it, run it by other lawyers, etc. Before it is published. Thank you for seeing me, Murdoch Thomas. I'm actually sorry I brought this to you. It is my problem and I will handle it myself. I turned and let myself out. I returned to the entrance area where Emily was waiting for me. How did it all go? She asked. I shouldn't have brought this problem to Murdot Thomas. I feel foolish. Then I asked her if I could just relax for a few minutes. In the lounge area. Of course, you can. I'll bring you another spiked coffee. Or something stronger if you like. I sat down in one of the plush chairs to think. I felt like I was out of ideas. There was no way I could stop Bray from going on her overnight date with Prince Charming. I dropped my head into my hands and started to feel sorry for myself. Then I heard Emily say, it's too early to drink. Let's go to lunch. I thought it would do me a world of good to be with Emily. That would be great. She used her intercom to call a coworker and tell her to take over her desk until she returned from a long lunch. Then she took me by the arm and we left for a restaurant that Emily especially liked.
We each started with an iced tea, but before we ordered, Emily said she wanted to know what problem was plaguing me. I told her the whole story. Then we ordered. We made some small talk while I picked up my Caesar salad. And Emily enjoyed her soup and half sandwich. After eating, we ordered coffee. Neither of us said much until Emily came at me off the wall. Did you know my late husband was a fighter pilot? I knew you were a widow and that your husband had died a long time ago, but I didn't know he was a fighter pilot. Yes, he was a jet fighter pilot. I married him the week after he graduated from the Air Force Academy. He spent a year in pilot training before he received his assignment to A-10s. He spent six months training in A-10, and then we were sent to our first permanent base, Davy Month and AFB outside of Tucson. I knew that the A-10 was an attack airplane that the Air Force acquired to support the Army on the ground. Its official name was Thunderbolt II after the Thunderbolt of WWI fame. Most pilots called it the Warthog because it was an ugly airplane, as jet fighters go, and it was down in the weeds all the time. Joe was killed six years later in an air combat tactics training mission and an experienced wingman accidentally collided with Joe's airplane. During those six years, Joe deployed to the Mideast twice. He must have done some pretty fancy flying, because he was awarded the Silver Star, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and two Bronze Stars. Emily was a little teary-eyed for a minute or so, while talking about her late husband. He was always my hero, she said. Maybe that's why I never remarried. However, she continued. The point of my story is that Joe would often talk about his training, particularly his air to air training. Some of it was offensive and some of it was defensive. Most of it was defensive. Since the A-10 was slow compared to other jets, he described one scenario called 1v2, in which an enemy fighter would attack his two ship element from behind. Joe would call for a hard turn to defeat a possible missile attack. If Joe's element stayed in formation, the enemy fighter would treat it as a single target and take both Joe and his wingman out in one pass. So, the fighters did what Joe described as a defensive split. At this point, the A-10 on the inside of the turn would go low while the other A-10 would go high. Now, the attacker had a choice. If he continued his attack on the low A-10, the high A-10 would roll off on the enemy's tail and shoot him down. If the enemy fighter went after the high A-10, the low A-10 would pitch back into the fight and shoot the attacker down. The point is, whatever choice the enemy made, it was the wrong decision and Joe would win. Emily's grasp of fighter tactics amazed me. But I didn't see the point. Are we still talking about Bree's date? I asked. Emily looked at me and said, give her a choice. Whatever choice she makes, you win. It was at that point that Emily took my hand, looked into my eyes, and gave me the most come-hither smile ever. After lunch with Emily, I went back to work. I worked late because I didn't want to spend the evening with Bree. I even stopped off at my favorite after-hours lounge, the Iris Club, for a few drinks with my friends. When I arrived home, it was 10 p.m. and Bree was waiting up. She was not happy with me. Not even a phone call to tell me you're going to be late. I went to a lot of trouble to make a nice dinner for us. It's in the refrigerator if you want anything to eat. Also, I was hoping that, perhaps, you would come back to our bed tonight and make love to me. Then, she noticed I was a little tipsy. Have you been drinking? I have, I answered. I was out late because I didn't want to deal with you tonight and I had a few drinks to help me forget about what you intend to do tomorrow night. And now, I'm blasted and I'm going to bed. Please, Ty, she said. Don't worry about tomorrow night. It will be over and in the past before you know it. We will be the same. I ignored her and went straight to the guest room, closed the door, stripped down to my underwear, and crashed on the bed. Strangely, I was up early the next morning. After coffee and toast, I started some weekend chores mowing the lawn, pulling weeds, and such. When I went back inside, Bree was preparing to leave. 
I'm going to the spa and to get my hair and nails done. She announced. I'll see you in three or four hours. I just had another cup of coffee. And watched her go without comment. Before she stepped out of the door, I said. Don't go through with this, Brie. It's not going to work out well for you. I took a shower and cleaned up, then went to the grocery store. In the middle of the afternoon, Brie returned. It was obvious she was getting dolled up for her date. Her hair was piled on top of her head in a sophisticated style. Her fingernails and even her toenails were painted bright red. However, I had been busy too. Brie looked her on as she walked by the living room. And family room and stopped. She called to me in the kitchen, Ty. Why is the rug rolled up and the coffee table moved against the wall? I stuck my head out of the kitchen and said. I made room for a dance floor. I also moved the big sofa in the living room. To a spot in front of the fireplace. Why are you doing all this? Brie asked. I'm doing this for you, I answered. I'm going to convince you to stay home this evening. And spend a romantic evening with me. Follow me into the kitchen, I said. Let me show you what you are in for. As Brie followed me. I pointed out that the dining room table was set for two with our best china and crystal. It was complemented with our sterling silver flatware. It even had a large bouquet of roses in the middle of the table. With a candle on either side to add to the ambience of the room. The table was laid out in the same manner. As at an expensive restaurant, two forks on the left side of the dinner plane. A knife and two spoons on the right side. A dessert spoon was placed horizontally above the top of the dish. A crystal glass for water was at each place setting. I know what you're trying to do, Ty. But it won't work. You know I have plans for this evening. I know what you are planning, Bree. But you can always change your plans. When something better comes along. Would you much rather disappoint me or Prince Charming? Please, Ty, don't do this to yourself. Follow me into the kitchen, I said. In the kitchen. There was a variety of foods in different stages of preparation. First of all. I have made a cold green gazpacho soup topped with chopped yellow tomatoes, cilantro, and cucumber. Next is my own salad design. Chopped iceberg lettuce with avocado and bacon, and ranch dressing. After a small shot glass of lime sherbet to freshen your palate. We have the entree. A 5-ounce pork chop stuffed with rice and herbs. And covered with a Bernays sauce. Our vegetable will be asparagus. Mixed with chopped cauliflower sautéed in garlic butter. And complemented with potatoes au gratin. Please stop, Ty. This is over the top. It sounds wonderful. But you cannot dissuade me from going out tonight. Let me try, I said. After resting a few minutes. I will serve dessert a small cup of vanilla bean ice cream. Covered with a shot of green cream de menthe followed by coffee with a liqueur of your choice. For music. I have selected my favorite CD, One Stormy Night by the Misty Moons Orchestra. It is soft instrumental music with the sound of rain. And a thunderstorm slowly approaching from the distance until it is directly overhead. It is designed for slow, intimate dancing. Of course. I will have a fire in the fireplace. Ty, I have to get ready to go. I bought a new dress for this evening, and I don't want to be late. Bree disappeared up the stairs and into the bedroom. When I heard the shower running, I went upstairs and changed into my black dress slacks. A black spun cotton dress shirt and my dance shoes. A suit and Ty were going to be too formal. For entertaining at home. By the time Brie reappeared downstairs, she was dressed to kill. It was the classic LBD with a low neckline. That showed off the tops of her breasts nicely. It was short, knee length. The skirt was split almost up to her mid-hip. And I could see the tops of her thigh-high hose when she walked. She wore black FM and shoes with four-inch heels. And a diamond-encrusted strap over the top. How do I look? She asked. I was angry but I continued to show restraint and a neutral, but almost cheerful deportment. You look great. Like you're ready to get laid, I replied. It would be nice to know, however. 
that you dress that way for me and not your Prince Charming. This is a special occasion, Tai, and I wanted to look good. I will dress up for you some other time. On Sirius Radio, I heard George Michael start to sing. Careless Whispers. It was one of my favorite slow dance songs. I turned up the volume and said, May I have one dance before you leave? I asked. Brie appeared a little reluctant at first, but then said, Of course. I stepped forward and took her in my arms. We danced cheek to cheek as we always did when we slow danced. I enjoyed feeling her close to me. You're wearing my favorite cologne, she said. English leather, I replied. Toward the end of the song, I started to give her little butterfly kisses on the side of her face. She seemed to like that and mewed like a kitten. I might have her back, I thought. I let loose of her right hand and moved my hand to the top of her dress. I pulled it off of her shoulder at the same time. I gave her a real kiss on the side of her neck. She froze. No, Ty, don't do that. You know, I'm going out. We can do this some other time. For the last time, I said, It's not too late to change your mind. I'm not going to do this, Ty. And she broke my embrace. I'm going on this date, and I don't want you to spoil it. Don't worry, Pri. I'm not going to interfere anymore. I can see you have made your decision, and it's final. However, there are two things I want you to do before you step out the door. Brie looked at me suspiciously. First, I want you to see what the dining room table looks like when the candles are lit, and the lights and turned down low, and I want you to remember how romantic it looked. As you stepped out the door, I lit the candles and dimmed the lights. We can have a romantic dinner next week, Ty. I stepped up to her and took her left hand in mine. I took hold of her wedding and engagement rings and pulled them from her finger. While you're wearing the rings I gave you on the day I proposed and the day you were married, Brie looked uneasy as I placed her rings and my wedding ring along with it on the small table in the foyer. She looked both embarrassed and ashamed for a few seconds. All she said was, fine, as Brie turned to pick up her shawl and clutch purse. The doorbell rang. We could see a form outside through the cut class door. Who could that be at this hour? She mused. Since she was closest to the door, she opened it. Emily, what? She said in almost a whisper. Emily, what are you doing here? She finally asked. I stepped around Brie and held out my hand to help Emily over the threshold and into the foyer. Brie now took notice of the cocktail dress that Emily was wearing. There was nothing of the conservative secretary. She had known from work. It was in your face red, off the shoulder, and looked like it would fall past her prominent breasts if it were not for two spaghetti straps over her shoulders. Each strap was tied with a bow knot. If the bow was pulled, the dress would fall to the floor. The dress was not short. It went down to about mid-calf. But it was slid up to the tops of her red, French pattern stockings. Her hair was piled on top of her head and held with a wide red bow. She looked beyond good, she looked great. Ty invited me when he dimmed the lights in the dining room. Emily said flatly. He promised me a candlelight dinner. Slow dancing to romantic music. Snuggling by a fireplace and a full night of more lust and sex than I could imagine. What girl could say no to that? You look so different than you do at work, we blurted out. I like to get dressed up for special occasions. Emily replied. And then she added, and you look beautiful too. That is a very sexy dress you're wearing. Stanley is going to love to remove it. Stanley. You know about Stanley. Of course. Stanley Wilbur, Emily responded. Everybody does. Who is everybody? Brie asked, well, everybody in the paralegal division. Most people in the tax department know, thanks to Stanley. How could they possibly have found out? We tried to be so careful. Careful, my ass, Emily laughed. Ever since Stanley was sent down here to work for us, he's been looking to get in your pants. For one reason or another, he was drawn to you. 
Your response to his slick approach has been classic. Almost immediately, you started to dress more sexy, short skirts instead of slacks, sweaters with cleavage instead of blouses, heels instead of flats, more makeup. He even had you wearing his favorite perfume. And then, all the secret touches that nobody was supposed to see. And the lunches together. You were an open book. Where was I? I thought. I didn't notice a thing. Bree didn't have a coherent reply. I didn't realize I was being so obvious. It was just supposed to be a little flirting. Then, I became infatuated with Stanley. Finally. We admitted to having feelings for each other and that we wanted to be together, as close as a man. And woman can be at least once. I was starting to show my anger. Well, now you can be, I said. I pulled Bree's shawl up around her shoulders. And opened the door for her. Don't come back here before mid-morning tomorrow. I added and took her arm to direct her to the front porch. Bree lamented, I never thought that you would. I gave you every chance to decide to stay home with me. Rather, you preferred to spend the night with Prince Charming. I hope you are happy with the choice you made. It broke my heart. My final words to Bree before I shut the door were, Have a good time tonight. I'm sure I will. Bree stood on the porch for one or two minutes. Before her shadow disappeared into the night. I heard her car drive away. I was sad. I was unable to persuade Bree to give up her date and stay with me. Things would never be the same again. Emily noticed my sigh and the sadness in my eyes. I can't imagine how you feel, Ty, but remember what I said. No matter what choice Bree makes, you win. With that, she moved her hands up my chest and encircled my face. Her breasts pressed against me and gave me a chaste kiss. I returned it. I put my arms around her waist and pulled her close. Our kiss turned into a long, wet French kiss and our bodies ground against each other. We were both breathing hard when Emily broke the kiss and said, Let's have dinner. I told her it wasn't quite ready yet but she could help me. If she wanted. As I stepped into the kitchen, I pointed out the three bottles of wine I had opened a light, white chardonnay, a rose, and a robust cabernet. She chose the chardonnay. After I poured it for her and she tasted it. I put an apron on her and from the front, tied the apron strings behind her. After a quick kiss, she giggled and asked what I wanted her to do. I've baked a half pound of bacon, I said. I need you to cut five strips into one inch pieces. And mix it in with the shredded lettuce. And then you can cut the avocado into chunks and put it in there. Two. While Emily was busy doing that as well as sipping her wine, I was starting to feel a little overwhelmed. I stood next to the most beautiful woman in the world, and I suddenly felt I didn't know enough about making love to satisfy her. Compared to me, who had made love to only one woman in my entire life? She must be very experienced with a variety of lovers over the years. I stepped behind her and put my hands on her waist. I haven't made love to any woman in my whole life except Ray. I said. It makes me a little anxious to believe. That I won't be nearly as good as the men you have experienced in your life. Emily leaned back into me. I'm not worried, Ty. Just do to me what you would do to Bray. And we'll take it from there. If I want something different, I'll tell you. Likewise, if you want something from me, I'll do it. Whatever it is. By the way, Emily added, I love foreplay. I kissed her on the back of her neck. Thank you. Have you ever been a cheerleader? You inspire a lot of confidence in a man. Thank you. The salad is ready. She carried the salad bowl to the dining room table. I held her chair when she sat. And took my place at the head of the table. Before we started dinner. I topped off our wine glasses and we had a toast. To a memorable night together, she said. I can't improve on that thought, I replied. Dinner was smooth. Despite the fact that I had to get up as we finished one course and started another. Emily gushed at the overall meal. And said it was a five-star dinner anywhere in the world. As I finished my ice cream. 
I told Emily to relax in the family room while I cleared the dishes from the table. Once the dining room looked pristine again, I joined her. Emily had been listening to the thunderstorm. As it approached in the music from the stereo, and swayed back and forth in time with it. As I approached her, she slid into a dance position with me and we enjoyed the soft music together. This is so romantic, hi. I'm having such a good time. So am I, I responded. You should know that it has been a long while. Since I have been with a man. And I haven't been with that many. However, the men I have been with I have liked very much. I like you very much, Ty. That's good to know, I said as we slowly swayed to the music. If, sometime tonight, I should say, I love you. Don't be angry with me. I will mean it while we are together. And when we part, I want us to be the best of friends. It wasn't long before we were not really dancing but, rather, just holding each other. I have my hands around her waist and she had hers around my neck. Stroking the hair on the back of my head. We were pressing our bodies tightly against one another. I could feel her breasts. Her thighs and her legs all at the same time. I'm certain she could feel me too. I broke far enough apart to kiss her on her neck and throat. Emily threw her head back and sighed. I was starting to get carried away. When Emily stopped me from kissing her and stepped away. Give me a few minutes to change into something more comfortable. And then we can sit on the sofa in front of the fire and cuddle. You can get into something more comfortable, too, if you like. I took advantage of the few minutes I had to strip. I put on my black silk pajama bottoms. And my matching black silk t-shirt. I poured a cup of coffee. And added a shot of Bailey's Irish cream to it and then sat down on the sofa to wait for Emily. In a few minutes, I heard her behind me. Before I could move, she slid her arms over the back of the sofa and under my shirt, and kissed me on the neck. I rolled onto my back in order to see her. She was standing behind the sofa now wearing a black satin robe. That was open in the front. Underneath the robe, it was easy to see a black negligee. Her hair was down, and her legs were bare. I took her by the hand and pulled her over the back of the sofa. She fell on top of me. She looked so alluring I had to kiss her. At first it was a chaste, sweet kiss. But her mouth opened up and her tongue darted into my mouth. We French kissed fervently and for a long time. My hands wandered over her body. I pulled her robe over her shoulder and exposed her negligee. It barely covered her large, firm breasts. I ran my hand over her smooth skin and pulled at the rope. Until it slid completely off of her body and ended up on the floor. After more than an hour of intense lovemaking Emily went limp. And closed her eyes. I realized that she had passed out and I hoped it was only briefly. Soon, she rolled her head left and right, opened her eyes. And smiled at me. Oh, sweetheart, that was the most wonderful fuck of my life. I think I passed out and that has never happened before. I guess that's a compliment, I said. You literally fucked me senseless. She said as she tightened her arms around me and held me close. However, I feel a little guilty. You were so attentive to me that I completely neglected you. We sat up on the sofa and I pulled my pajama bottoms back up. And Emily tied the front of her negligee together. Would you like some coffee with Bailey's now? I asked. She said yes and I retrieved two hot coffees from the kitchen. As we sipped our drinks, we cuddled on the sofa in front of the fire and touched each other. When you are ready to go again, Ty, it will be my turn to take care of you. As much fun as we had had on the sofa, we decided to spend the rest of the night in bed. We were both still worn out. After our lovemaking in the family room, so we cuddled together for a while under the covers and made pillow talk until we drifted off into sleep. Sleepily, I kissed her shoulders and her neck the next morning. Emily started to sigh and turned her upper body far enough that we could kiss each other on the lips. Then, she spooned against me with her hips. I pressed my midsection into her butt and was rewarded with more squirming. Needless to say, I became aroused very quickly and Emily could feel it. 
She turned her face to me again and said, I love you, Tai. I want you to make love to me. I want that, too. With that, she opened her legs enough to allow me to enter her from behind, and we made slow, sensual love to each other. From her reaction, I think she came several times. It's been a wonderful night for me, too, she said. We slept again until it was light outside. Emily awoke me with little butterfly kisses all over my face. We smiled at each other. I said, there are so many more things I would like to do to you. But there doesn't seem to be enough time. We had quality in our lovemaking. I prefer it to quantity. However, I still want to take a shower with you. We showered together and made love one last time. We started by soaping each other down which was just an excuse. To run our hands all over each other. As I started to relax, I was reluctant to disengage from her. Knowing that this was the last time I would have her. Emily must have felt similarly because she was crying. I turned her around and held her tight while kissing her lips. Her face and her neck. Finally, we both sighed. We knew our night and morning of passion was over. I stepped out of the shower first to give Emily time. To finish cleaning herself up. I was ready with a big, fluffy towel when she stepped out. I dressed casually and so did Emily, who brought some clothes. Would you like to go to Sunday brunch? I suggested. Emily quickly agreed. And I took her to the Cheesecake Factory at the nearby mall. It was 10 a.m. and they were just opening. When I returned home about noon, I noted Bree's car in the garage. I entered the house by the side door and walked through the kitchen toward the dining room. I noticed that there was a pot of coffee on the stove and poured myself a cup. I could see that Bree was sitting at the table waiting for me with a cup in front of her. She looked very stern. Meanwhile, I was very relaxed and had a smile on my face like the cat that ate the canary. I thought I should address the elephant in the room. Well, how did your evening go? It was okay, she replied. How was your evening? I felt I should be honest. It was the most exciting night of lust and passion that I ever had with a woman. Emily was extremely affectionate. And we did just about everything possible to please one another. I saw Brie bow her head and watched a tear run down her cheek. I had a terrible time. It was the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. What happened? I asked. Wasn't Stanley the ardent lover you expected him to be? It wasn't Stanley, Bree sniffed. It was me. I couldn't stop thinking about you and Emily. And what you were doing. She was so beautiful and luscious. I knew you were going to have a much better time with her. Than I was going to have with Stanley. He tried to be affectionate and wanted to do everything possible. To make it a romantic night for us. But I kept thinking of you and Emily. I started drinking wine at the bar, even before we sat down at our table for dinner. During dinner I just picked at my food. I had lost my appetite. However, I continued to drink wine and finished most of the first bottle by myself. Stanley tried to stop me from drinking more, by taking me to the lounge for some dancing, but by then, I was pretty much obliterated. And I was tripping all over myself. I hadn't been very good company for Stanley. And he was starting to get angry. He suggested we go up to our room. Once in our room, Stanley was all over me. He wanted to French kiss me and I didn't like it. Next, he started to undress me. I was looped enough that he got me down to my bra and panties. He wouldn't stop pawing me and kissing me. He couldn't get me turned on. I finally decided to let him fuck me just to make him stop trying to ravage me. I took off my bra and Stanley took off my panties and his clothes. I just laid on the bed and let him have me. I didn't feel anything, no excitement, no passion, no arousal. Nothing. He sensed my complete lack of interest in him physically. And when he finished, he said, that was my worst lay ever. What is wrong with you? You wanted this as much as I did and now you act like a prude. He looked at me with a disappointed expression on his face. Then he got dressed. If you don't want me, I don't want you. 
I can't believe I put so much time and effort into seducing you. And it ended this way. I've wanted to fuck you ever since I laid eyes on you. Stay here if you like. I'm going to the bar and try to find some action. Once he was gone, I just cried until I fell asleep. When I woke up, the sun was shining and it was almost mid-morning. I thought you would be home alone by then so I showered. And dressed and left the hotel. When I arrived home, you were not here. Emily and I went to brunch and from there, she went home. Since I had such a great time last night, I continued. I feel sort of bad that your evening was such a bust. But not that bad. I'm so sorry, Ty, that I ever got involved with Stanley. I realize now, he just wanted to have sex with me. He didn't care about me in the slightest. Not like I cared about him. Well, maybe you'll have better luck next time. I lamented sarcastically. No, Ty, I will never do that again, never. I want to go back to the way it was when we were exclusive. I want to be monogamous again. I want to put this incident behind us and be happy together. Just you and me, forever. I promised you that if you didn't interfere with my date, I would be the best wife ever. I meant that and I'm going to spend the rest of my life proving it. Not so fast, Bree, I said. You've spent the last six months in an emotional relationship with Prince Charming and the last two months planning on how you two could fuck each other. And now, because things didn't work out for you, you want to go back to the way we were before. That's not going to happen. I'm not certain I want to be married to you any longer. You've hurt me beyond anything I can express. You betrayed our marriage. You humiliated me and wanted to turn me into a cuckold. Then? You wanted me to just suck it all up and accept your transgressions as if nothing happened. It's not going to work that way, I said. For the next year, I'm going to give myself a hall pass once a month. I'm going to allow myself to go out on a date and overnight date with any woman I decide to be with. If I end up in a relationship, then so be it. At the end of a year, I will reevaluate our marriage. If I'm still not happy with it, I will divorce you. If, maybe, I'm happy with it, then I'll consider becoming exclusive again. You'll have that year to prove to me that you are worth keeping. You can accept these terms or not. If you don't, I will start divorce proceedings on Monday. Let me know what you decide. I love you, Ty, Bree began. But I took you for granted. I know that now. It will kill me to know you are having sex with some other woman. Like it killed me last night. However, the last thing in the world I want is a divorce. It would kill my soul to lose you. Therefore, I'll agree to your terms. And I'll keep my promise to be the best wife in the world so that, at the end of a year, you'll know without a doubt that you will want us to stay together. It's settled then. I didn't know whether or not. I was really going to date other women over the next 12 months or so. But I would do it in a heartbeat if an opportunity presented itself. For the rest of the day. I'm going to work in the yard and run some errands. If you don't mind doing the dishes from last night and straightening up the house, I'll take you out to TGI Fridays this evening and we can split an order of ribs. That peace offering was my way of trying to normalize things. For the future, I didn't want any girl as between us as the trial year started. I guessed right. That night I got laid in style. Epilogue one a few weeks later, things were going along well. Bree was being a very attentive wife and it seemed genuine. Meals improved markedly, at dinner time especially. Every dinner includes a glass of wine. The meal was made up of a small salad or cup of soup, followed by a small entree such as a five-ounce steak with potato or rice and a vegetable. She even added a small dessert. After dinner, Bree cleaned up the dishes. I helped by putting the extra food and condiments away. The sex was better, too more frequent and more passionate. There was nothing that Brie would not let me do to her. One night, when we were eating dinner, Brie said, very casually, I talked with Emily today. I tried to show no surprise and answered, oh, what about? Brie answered, you me, 
and her. What did she have to say? Well, the first thing she said was, let's go to lunch. And she took me to one of her favorite nearby restaurants. I thought that it was probably the same one she took me to. Over a glass of wine or two, and a salad. I asked her very directly if she was going to take you away from me. She laughed and said, not a chance. Ty and I were lovers for one night. And now we are the best of friends. We'll never get together like that again. Besides, he loves the shit out of you. Even though he was bitterly disappointed and hurt by your actions. I imagine he still is. Bree said that she told Emily. I'm so ashamed of what I did to tie into our marriage. I know I can't undo it. I promise to be a much better wife to him than I have been in the past. I intend to keep that promise, and I hope he responds. I told Emily about your intention. To date other women once a month, and then reevaluate our marriage at the end of a year. She asked me what I intended to do. I told her that I would try to suck it up. Just as I wanted him to do when I went out with Stanley. But it's going to be hard. I'm sure I'm going to cry a lot while he is on his dates. She asked me whether or not. I thought you would really have sex with other women. I said that I thought it was likely, maybe not every month. But occasionally. Maybe there's something you can do about that. Emily suggested. What? I asked her. Give him a choice. But without the option of having someone over to replace him in case he decides to step out on you. Make staying home with you so appealing. That he will discard his date in favor of a special night with his wife. I told Emily I would do that, so expect it. If that's you plan, I responded. I might arrange a bogus date just to see what you come up with. Epilogue 2 I had a big smile on my face. As I entered the outer offices of Thomas, Dixon, and Harris a few weeks later. Of course, Emily was guarding the gate to the partners. When she saw me. She stood up from her desk and hurried across that room to give me a big hug. It's wonderful to see you again, Ty. I was expecting you. Or rather, Mr. Thomas was expecting you. I just made the appointment for you to come in. While still holding her, I asked, Do you know what Mr. Thomas wants to see me about? Of course, I know, she answered. I know everything that goes on around here. However, Mr. Thomas will tell you himself. Emily went to her desk and, using the intercom, announced that I was here. Dotmer. Thomas told her to send me in. Emily led me to the big door to Mr. Thomas's office and let me in. Then she closed it as she left. From his desk on the far side of the room, Mr. Thomas stood up and waved me over. Ty, it's good to see you again. Please sit down. I've called you here for two reasons. Both concern you in a way so I wanted you to know about them. First of all, I wanted you to know that we have rewritten our company fraternization policy. It's a lot more comprehensive and all-encompassing. It should prevent situations similar to what you went through in the future because it delineates strong consequences to interpersonal relationships between employees and between employees and clients. I have a copy for you to read at your leisure. Let me know what you think of it. I thank Mr. Thomas for thinking about me and the problem I brought to him earlier. Without getting to personal, Ty, Mr. Thomas continued, how are things going at home? I sincerely hope that you and Bree are doing well together. He went on, I visited Bree's section a few days ago and talked with her. I didn't discuss your marital situation, but rather discussed the current work being done by her section and asked if there were any problems that I could help with. My observation was that she seemed happy and content. I didn't want to go into details about the current states of affairs between Bree and myself, so I simply said, things are getting better and I expect we'll be all right in the long run. Murdot Thomas responded, I'm happy to hear that. The other reason I wanted to talk with you is that I wanted you to hear the letter I was sending to Hughes, Doit, and Lewis, the law firm that Stanley Wilbur works for, regardless of his interpersonal relationship with Bree. 
He did a great job in assisting us in a tax case that we didn't have the expertise to handle at the time. With that said, Thomas put on his glasses, picked up a handwritten letter, and started to read. Dear Steve, you have the official effectiveness report on the performance of Stanley Wilbur regarding the assistance he gave us. During his tenure with Thomas, Dixon, and Harris, he was instrumental in guiding my lawyers through the myriad of problems involved with the case and, at the same time, he taught our lawyers how to deal with such cases in the future. However, this private, informal letter is to describe another side of Stanley's Wilbur's performance. That was less than acceptable. He became involved in a personal relationship with one of our married employees. This prolonged seduction resulted in a sexual encounter with this married woman before his departure. The encounter was well known by the spouse of our employee. It impacted the relationship with his wife and disrupted their marriage to the point that its viability is not certain. The public's view of lawyers in general is not that great. Most feel that lawyers want to win at the expense of justice or want to make money at the expense of their clients. All we really have going for us is our integrity. The integrity of Stanley Wilbur in his personal life is dubious. Further, I feel that his lack of integrity in his personal relationships could easily be applied to his professional ethics as well. For that reason, I would like to warn you to be careful of the legal functions Stanley Wilbur performs on behalf of your law firm. Again, this is an informal letter just between you and me. Take whatever action you deem necessary with regard to this lawyer. Or take no action at all. I leave it up to you. Your friend, William Mr. Thomas put the letter down and said, This letter doesn't provide complete justice for what Stanley did to you and Bree. But it will not help him to advance in his firm. At least not nearly as quickly as he might expect to. That is about the extent of what I can do for you, Ty. I hope you are satisfied to some degree. That Stanley did not get away with what he did without consequences. I thank Mr. Thomas for what he did on my behalf and left his office. I was deep in thought when I realized that. Emily was standing with me, trying to scrutinize my expression. Well, she said. I'm reasonably happy with the way things worked out. And the way things are working out. I went on. I owe you a lot for being my friend throughout all of this. Thank you. Don't forget, Ty. She said as she put her arms around me and held me close. I got a lot out of this too. I was really in love with you while we were together. And I loved you, too, I replied.